Gentlemen, yield this time to Ms. Callan. Yes. The, gen the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Callan, if I may. I'm yes, so certainly. I have, a, I have a number of things I think I, I need to clear up, if I may. Yes, certainly. Um, and you don't have to bear with me because I, I have a, a number of them here. Um, first of all, on the, on the call, Tim Morrison, General Kellogg, have a totally different view of the call than Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and Jennifer Williams. Going to the point that the call is ambiguous. So that, that's the first thing. Tim Morrison testified that he went to the National Security Council lawyers for a very different reason. He, he did not say he went to the NSC lawyers because he was concerned about the call. He went to the National Security Council lawyers for two, for two reasons. Number one, they weren't on the call, so he wanted to update them about it. But number two, he was concerned about leaks. And he was concerned that if this call leaked out, how it would play in Washington's polarized environment, which is exactly what we have here. He was also concerned that if the call leaked, that it might affect bipartisan support in Congress. You, 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 you know, the issues of Ukraine have traditionally been one of the, the few issues where Republicans and Democrats share um, interests. And the third reason was that he didn't, he didn't want the Ukrainians to get a distorted perception of what actually happened on the call, because on the call, and we're talking about eight lines of concern uh, and, and a lot of ambiguity. Um, this Oval Office meeting on May 23rd, there's this question, I guess it's ambiguous, I didn't think it was ambiguous, but there's a question about whether when the president referred the dele the delegation goes to the inauguration May 20th. They come back, it's Sondland, it's Volcker, um, and, and it's, it's Secretary Perry and it's Senator Johnson. And they're, they're briefing the president, and the president is having none of it. He says Ukraine is concerned, or uh, corrupt, and he, he doesn't want to invite Zelensky to the White House. Um, and the, the president, and Volcker testifies to this pretty definitively, the president, essentially, he doesn't order anybody to do anything. The president says, talk to Rudy. And Volcker testified, both at, at his deposition, and at the public hearing, that he didn't take it as a direction. It's just like, look, if you, if you guys, if you guys think this is important and you want to work it, go just go talk to Rudy. It's very different than a than a direction. It's very different than the president ordering a scheme. Um, he did, and it's very very different from the president sort of collecting up a bunch of agents to go do something. Because he simply, according to Ambassador Volker, said go talk to Rudy. Now, whether the Ukrainians knew of the aid pause, or the aid was paused for 55 days. Right. Whether the Ukrainians knew about it or not has been, you know, Laura Cooper from DOD, and you know, some State Department witnesses testified about light queries that they had received. Um, there was an article on November 22nd in Bloomberg, and the Zelensky administration said they never knew about the hold in the aid until August 28th Politico article. And they said in, in the article, and Yarmak is the principal person they're relying on here, Yarmak says that they believe the embassy was keeping information from them. Another interesting thing Mr. Yarmack says in that November 22nd Bloomberg article is that he recounts the Holocide meeting with Sondland, which has become very significant, apparently. In the Holocide meeting, he says, he doesn't recall it the way Ambassador Sondland recalled it. Now, keep in mind, Ambassador, or, uh, Mr. Yarmack speaks uh, English, but it's not his first language, um, and so he, he does not recall the Holocide meeting, which, by the way, happened on the way to an escalator um, after the meeting with the vice president, so he recalls it very differently. So the question and the facts of what happened between Ambassador Sondland and Mr. Yarmack on the way to the escalator remain in dispute.
Now, turning attention to the, the Ron Johnson letter, if I may. Yes. On August 31st, Senator Johnson's getting ready to travel to Ukraine on September 5th with, Sen with Senator um, with Murphy. And he, he wanted, Johnson wanted the aid release, so he calls the president, and he actually sought permission to be the bearer of good news. Right. The president said, I'm not ready to, to lift the aid. And they had this, Senator Johnson, I mean, he, he writes a 10-page letter, very, um, very detailed, uh, and he, he gives some, some remarkable detail, um, and I'd like to read it. It's on page six. I, I, this is Senator Johnson speaking. He said, I asked him whether there was some kind of arrangement where Ukraine would take some action and the hold would be lifted. Without hesitation, Senator Johnson says, President Trump immediately denied such an arrangement existed and he started cursing. And he said, no way. President Trump said, no way. I would never do that. Who told you that? And Senator Johnson goes on to say that, that President Trump's reaction here was adamant, vehement, and angry. Senator Johnson goes on to say that as of August 31st, the president told him, but I'm, you're gonna like my decision in the end. So I think that's very important context uh, on what the president's state of mind was, at least as of August 31st. Right, he fully expected, do you agree? Uh, that yep. the aid would eventually be released after the 55-day pause, Yes. right? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I want to thank you all for your presentations. Uh, Mr. Castor, I believe you've been talking for approximately 75 minutes today, um, and I want to thank you for that. Um, my, my wife thanks you as well. She likes it when I do the talking when she's not around. <laughs> Um, time permitting today, I'd like to cover four or five areas, um, distinct areas. Um, there's a lot of facts that the American people have not heard. And there's a lot of contradictions in certain people's testimony. Is that fair to say, Mr. Castor? And I'd like to talk about some of the people in this story that have firsthand knowledge of the facts. We have Ambassador Volker, Ambassador Sondland, and Secretary Perry. You had the opportunity to talk to two of those three people, is that correct? Yes. And the Democrats' report would like us to believe that these three individuals were engaged in some sort of cabal or some sort of nefarious venture. But that's not true, is it? No. In fact, these three people were at all relevant times and even today acting in the best interest of the American people. Is that true? That's right, and with the highest integrity. That's right. I think everyone testified that Ambassador Volker is one of the most experienced diplomats in our foreign service. Across the board, all the witnesses, including Ambassador Yovanovitch, talked about the integrity that Ambassador Volker brings to the table. But there's a lot of people with firsthand knowledge that we didn't talk to, is that correct? Yes. Um, now I want to talk about uh, the president's skepticism of foreign aid. The president is very skeptical of foreign aid, is that correct? He is deeply skeptical of sending U.S. taxpayer dollars into an environment that is corrupt because it's as good as kissing it goodbye. And is that something new that he believes or is that something he ran on? This is something that he has ran on. It's something that he has implemented policies as soon as he became president. Ambassador Hale, the third ranking State Department official, told us about the over, you know, overall review of all foreign aid programs and he described it as almost a zero-based uh, evaluation. Right, and you had the opportunity to take the deposition of Mark Sandy, who is a career official at OMB, is that right? Correct. And he had some information about the reason for the pause. Is that true? I think that he had a conversation with an individual 
named Rob Blair, and Mr. Blair provided some insight into the reason for the pause. Sandy was one of the few witnesses that we had that was able to give us a first-hand account inside of OMB, the, the reason for the, for, the, for the pause related to the president's concern about European burden, burden sharing right. in the region. And he, and really? in fact, Here. in his conversations, the president's conversations with Senator way. Johnson, Nobody he mentions his concern about burden sharing. And I believe he referenced a conversation that he had with the chancellor of Germany. Um, and in fact, the whole first part of the July 24th transcript, he's talking about burden sharing and wanting the Europeans to do more. Um, but yeah, I mean, Senator Johnson was, and President Trump were, they were pretty candid, and you know they believed that allies like Germany were were laughing at us because we were so willing to to spend the aid. Right. Um, now I'd like you know there's been a lot of uh, allegations that President Zelensky is not being candid about feeling pressure from President Trump. And isn't it true that he stated over and over publicly that he felt no pressure from President Trump? Is that true? Yeah, he's, he said it consistently. He said it in the United Nations September 25th. He said it, um, you know, in three more news availabilities over the course of the period, including last week. I want to change subject, subjects and talk about something that Professor Turley raised last week, and that is um, the partisan nature of this investigation. Uh, and you're an experienced congressional investigator. And, and Professor Turley, by the way, I mean, he's no Trump supporter. That's right. Oh. He is a Democrat. That's right. Um, and, but Professor Turley cautioned that a partisan inquiry is not what the founders envisioned. Is that correct? Correct. And the worst thing you can have with an impeachment is partisan rancor right. because nobody's going to accept the result on the other side. And our Democrat friends have all of a sudden become originalists and are citing the founders and their intent routinely as part of this impeachment process. I think that goes to the. the this, 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 whether this constitutes uh, bri bribery, um, you know, there's, there's, there's case law on bribery, and I'm no, I'm no Supreme Court scholar or lawyer or advocate, but, um, you know, there's new case law with the McDonald case about what constitutes an official act, and that certainly hasn't been, um, you know, addressed in this space, and I, th I think Professor Turley mentioned that. Right, and I think Professor Turley said that a meeting certainly does not constitute an official act. I think it's the McDonald case. Right. Um, goes to and that. Professor Turley pointed that out for us last mm -hmm. week. Yes. Um, since this inquiry's unofficial and unsanctioned start in September, the process has been partisan, biased, unfair. Um, Republicans questioning has been curtailed routinely. Um, I think we saw that uh, in Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman's deposition. There was some, you know, yeah, we were barred from asking him questions about who he communicated his concerns to. Right. Very basic things like who, what, when, where. And instead... And I would say, too, this, this rapid, you know, we're in day 76, and it's almost impossible to do a sophisticated congressional investigation that quickly, especially when the stakes are this high, because any congressional investigation of any consequence, it, it, it does take a little bit of time for the two sides to stake out their, their interests and how they're gonna to respond to them. Um, right. You know, we learned with the goodlatte Gowdy probe, you know, the first letter I think went in October of, um, 2017, and you know, in December we finally got a witness, 
And it was the following spring with, in the Good Luck Audi probe, after a lot of pushing and pulling and a lot of tug of war, we, we reached a deal with DOJ where we went, we went down to DOJ and they gave us access to documents and they gave us access to, I think, you know, north of 800,000 pages. But they made us come down there. They made us go into a skiff and these documents weren't classified. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't until May and June of that year that we started this process when the investigation had been ongoing. And, and that is uh, disappointing. Obviously, we all wish there was an easy button, but congressional investigations of consequence uh, take time. Right. And it took, I think, six months before the first document was even produced. And like you said, you had to go down there mm -hmm. and review it in camera. Mm -hmm. And then going back even further to Fast and Furious, mm -hmm. the investigation of the death of a yeah. Border Patrol agent. Yeah, I mean, Fast and Furious, we issued subpoenas. Mr. Issa um, it had sent some subpoenas, I think, in February of 20, um, 2011. And we, we, we had a hearing in June with experts about proceeding to contempt. You know, what does it take to go to contempt? And that, that was the first time in June when we got any production. And the production was largely publicly available information. And we, went, we spent most of the year trying to get information out of the Justice Department. At the time, we were also working um, with whistleblowers who, who were providing us documents. And, uh, Chairman Issa at the time, then in October, issued another subpoena that was um, to the Justice Department. And so the, the investigation had been ongoing most of the year. We were talking to whistleblowers, we're doing interviews, and we're doing our best to get documents out of the Justice Department through that channel. But it, it, these things take time. Right. Certainly and not 76 days. Yes. And if you truly want to uncover every fact, as you should in an impeachment, do you agree? You have to go to court sometimes and enforce your subpoenas. And here, my understanding is we have a lot of requests for information, voluntary information. <laughs> you know, will you please provide us with documents on X, Y, Z? And I think, and I think that's great. But you have to back it up with something, isn't that correct? Well, there's a number of ways to enforce your requests. I mean, the, the fundamental rule of any congressional investigation is you, you, you rarely get what you're asking for unless and until the alternative is less palatable for the respondent. So, you know, you issue a subpoena and you're trying to get documents, you know, one technique you can use is try to talk to the, you know, a document custodian or somebody in, le you know, the ledge affairs function about what documents exist. Um, Chairman Chaffetz, during his era, had, uh, he used to have these document production status hearings where you'd bring, bring in Ledge Affairs officials and try to get the lay of the land. Because, you know, Ledge Affairs officials, at least nominally, are supposed to be um, directly responsible uh, s serving the interests. Um, you can you saber rattle, it's legal to saber rattle, about uh, holding somebody in contempt. Uh, oftentimes, witnesses who are reluctant to cooperate and come forward, when you, when, you, when you attach a contempt proceeding or a prospective contempt proceeding uh, to their name, uh, a lot of times that changes the outcome. Uh, and with, with a contempt proceeding, you've got a couple different steps along the way. You could raise the prospect of a contempt proceeding. You could schedule a contempt proceeding. Uh, after you schedule a contempt proceeding, you could you know, hold the door open for documents or interviews, and then you could push it off. Uh, you could go through at the committee level. And these are all sort of milestone events, which historically are unpalatable or less palatable for the administration that sometimes starts to move the needle. And, and with these types of disputes, once you get the ball rolling, you know, with the Good Luck Gaudi probe, we didn't get a witness, and it was Deputy Director Andrew McCabe in for, you know, it was a couple months. But once we got Deputy Director McCabe in, a couple weeks later, we got uh, Director Comey's Chief of Staff. A couple weeks later, I mean, the witnesses start, once you get the ball rolling, 
Um, you, you, again, you don't always like 100% of the terms. Sometimes you got to deal with agency counsel. Sometimes you got to go look in, ca in camera. But once you get the ball rolling, usually it leads to positive results and, and historically has allowed the Congress to do its work. And were any of those things done here? No. In fact, they decided we're not going to we're, we're not going to subpoena certain people that are important. Is that fair to say? And we're not going to go to court and enforce them. So these people have, you know, these folks that are caught mm -hmm. in an interbranch struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's an unfortunate position for any employee. Of the well, one of the concerning government. things is is Dr. Kupperman, who has been described uh, by Dr. Fiona Hill and. A number of witnesses is a as a, a solid citizen, a good witness. Um, he he filed a lawsuit in the, in the, in the face of a subpoena, and um, a judge was assigned to a judge Leon. Uh, and the the issues the Kupperman raised were slightly different than the Don McGahn issues, because you know Don McGahn is the personal for the White House counsel. Kupperman, of course, is a national security official. Um, Kupperman, you know, filed the lawsuit seeking guidance. Kupperman wasn't asking the court to tell him not to come testify. To the contrary, Kupperman was seeking the court's guidance to facilitate his cooperation. And, and ultimately, um, this, the committee with, withdrew the subpoena, <laughs> um, yeah. which, which raises questions about whether the committee is really interested in getting to the bottom of some of these issues. Right. Instead, the committee's chosen the Intelligence Committee has chosen to rely on Ambassador Sondland and his testimony. I think they rely 600 times in their report. I'll tell you what I did. I, I, on this point, I, yesterday, I opened the Democrat report and I did a control F, yes. you know, control F. Yes. And Sondland's name shows up, I think, 611 times. Um, in, in fairness, it's, it's going to be double counted because, you know, if it's in a sentence and then it's in a footnote, that's two. Um, but in relative comparison to the other witnesses, um, Sondland's relied on big time. Yes. And I think Dr. Hill testified that she at some point confronted him about his actions. Yeah, the, 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 the record is mixed on this front. Um, Dr. Hill talks about raising concerns with Sondland, and Sondland in his deposition at least doesn't, you know, he didn't share the same view. And there's a lot of instances of that, where Ambassador Sondland recalls one thing and other witnesses recall another. Is that correct? Is, is, Sondland as a witness is a, uh, and he's a bit of an enigma. Let's just say it that way. Um, he was, you know, he was pretty certain in his deposition that the, the security assistance wasn't linked to anything. Um, and then he submitted a, he submitted an addendum. Yes, a, I call that the pretzel sentence. <laughs> and even in that addendum or supplement or whatever it's called, um, it, you know, it's talk to him and her, and, and anyway, it, it, Sondland uh, ends with, you know, I presumed. Right. So, so it wasn't really any firsthand information. Right. We don't have a lot of firsthand information here, is that correct? On certain facts, we, we don't. I mean, we have firsthand information on the May 23rd meeting in the Oval Office. We've got a lot of firsthand information, although all conflicting. <laughs> Um, on the July 10th meeting, um, there, there are, you know, episodes, I think, during the course of this investigation that we have been able to at least get everyone's account. Um, but the investigation hasn't, hasn't been able to reveal, you know, firsthand evidence relating to the president other than the, the call transcript. And... I think we've already talked about this, that Ambassador Sondland would presume things, assume things, and form opinions based on what other people told him, and then he would use those as firsthand. Is that correct? Um, 
You know, it started with his role with the Ukraine portfolio. A lot of people at the State Department were wondering why the ambassador to the EU was so engaged in you know, issues relating to the Ukraine. And, you know, there are answers for that. You know, Ukraine is an aspirant to join the EU. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons, and Mr. Turner, I think, explored this really well at the, at the open hearing. Um, but we, we asked Ambassador Sondland, he said he did a TV interview in Kyiv on, on the 26th of July, where he said the president's given me, you know, a lot of assignments, and he's, the president's assigned me to Ukraine and so forth. But then when we asked him in his deposition, he conceded that he was in fact spinning that the president never assigned him to Ukraine, that he was just, uh, he was, you know, he's, he was exaggerating. Um, and I think at the public hearings, you pointed out that in contrast to other witnesses, Ambassador Sondland isn't a note taker. He, in fact, he said, I do not recall yeah. dozens of times in his deposition. Um, let's say it this way. You know, Ambassador Taylor um, walked us through his his um, standard operating procedure for taking notes. He told us about having a notebook on his desk and a notebook in his coat pocket of his suit, and he brought it with us and he, he, he showed us. So consequently, when Ambassador Taylor recounts to us you know, what happened, it's backed up by these contemporaneous notes. Um, Ambassador Sondland, on the other hand, was, was very clear that, you know, on the first hand, he said that he did not have access to his State Department records. While he said that at the public hearing, simultaneously, the State Department issued a tweet, I think, or a statement at least, saying that wasn't true, that no, nobody is keeping Ambassador Sondland from his emails. You know, he's still a State Department employee, he's, he can go... Um, you, you know, he does have access to his records, but he stated he didn't. Um, and he stated that he doesn't have any notes because he doesn't take notes. Uh, and he conceded that he doesn't uh, have recollections of, on a lot of these issues. And, you know, we sort of made a list of them. And I, I think at the hearing, I called it the, the trifecta of unreliability. Yes. And you're not the only person that has concerns about Ambassador Sondland's testimony, conduct, um, I think other witnesses took issue with his conduct. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Tim Morrison um, talked about instances where an Ambassador Sondland uh, was sort of showing up uninvited. I, I, Morrison didn't understand why Sondland was trying to get into the Warsaw meeting September 1st. Um, and, and Dr. Hill, Fiona Hill, taught us uh, about issues of that sort and a number of witnesses, uh, you're correct. And Ambassador Reeker and Ambassador Sondland, too, correct? Yeah, I believe Ambassador Reeker well, said, he was a problem. said he was a problem, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Hill raised concerns about his behavior and said that he might be an intelligence risk. Is that correct? Uh, she, she did. She, she, she had issues with his uh, tendency to pull out his mobile device and make telephone calls. Right. And s which obviously can be monitored. Yes. By the bad guys. And we talked about how he was spinning that, you know, certain things. And he admitted that, how he was spinning. Um, and he admitted he exaggerated. Yes. And he also, he, you know, when it comes to his communications with the president, we tried to get him to list all the communications with the president. I think he gave us six. And then when he was back, at, you know, he walked us through each communication with the president. And by the way, it was about a Christmas party. It was about when the president of Finland was here. And then um, uh, Congresswoman Speer asked him the same question in the open hearing. And he, he said that he had talked to the president like 20 times. So the, the record is mixed. I think my time's up. Thank you both. Yield back. Yield back. The gentleman yield Mr. back. Mr. Chairman, Yay. Mr. Chairman. Under the five-minute rule.